Chapter 5 The Failure to Learn to Make a Living The greatest indictment of such education as Negroes have received is that they have thereby learned a little as to making a living, the first essential in civilization. Rural Negroes have always known something about agriculture, and in a country where land is abundant, they have been able to make some sort of living on the soil even though they have not always employed scientific methods of farming. In industry where the competition is keener, however, what the Negro has learned in school has had little bearing on the situation. In business, the role of education as a factor in the uplift of the Negro has been still less significant. The Negroes of today are unable to employ one another, and the whites are inclined to call on Negroes only when workers of their own race have been taken care of. For the solution of this problem, the miseducated Negro has offered no remedy whatever. What Negroes are now being taught does not bring their minds into harmony with life as they must face it. When a Negro student works his way through college by polishing shoes, he does not think of making a special study of the science underlying the production and distribution of leather and its products that he may someday figure in this sphere. The Negro boy sent to college by a mechanic seldom dreams of learning mechanical engineering to build upon the foundation his father has laid that in years to come he may figure as a contractor or a consulting engineer. The Negro girl who goes to college hardly wants to return to her mother if she is a washerwoman, but this girl should come back with sufficient knowledge of physics and chemistry and business administration to use her mother's work as a nucleus for modern steam laundry. A white professor of a university recently resigned his position to become rich by running a laundry for Negroes in a southern city. A Negro college instructor would have considered such a suggestion an insult. The so-called education of Negro college graduates leads them to throw away opportunities which they have and to go in quest of those which they do not find. In the case of the white youth in this country, they can choose their courses more at random and still succeed because of numerous opportunities offered by their people, but even they show so much more wisdom than do Negroes. For example, a year or two after the author left Harvard, he found out West, a schoolmate who was studying wool. How did you happen to go into this sort of thing? The author inquired. His people, the former replied, had some experience in wool, and in college he prepared for this work. On the contrary, the author studied Aristotle, Plato, Marsilio of Padua, and Pascasius Ralph Burtis when he was in college. His friend, who studied wool, is now independently rich and has sufficient leisure to enjoy the cultural side of life which his knowledge of the science underlying his business developed, but the author has to make his living by begging for a struggling cause. An observer recently saw at the market near his office a striking example of this inefficiency of our system. He often goes over there at noon to buy a bit of fruit and to talk with a young woman who successfully conducts a fruit stand there in cooperation with her mother. Some years ago, he tried to teach her in high school, but her memory was poor and she could not understand what he was trying to do. She stayed a few weeks, smiling at the others who toiled, and finally left to assist her mother in business. She learned from her mother how to make a living and be happy. This observer was reminded of this young woman soon thereafter when there came to visit him a friend who succeeded in mastering everything taught in high school at that time and later distinguished himself in college. This highly educated man brought with him a complaint against life. Having had extreme difficulty in finding an opportunity to do what he is trained to do, he has thought several times of committing suicide. A friend encouraged this despondent man to go ahead and do it. The sooner the better. The food and air which he is now consuming may then go to keep alive someone who is in touch with life and able to grapple with its problems. This man has been educated away from the fruit stand. This friend had been trying to convince this misfit of the unusual opportunities for the Negroes in business, but he reprimanded his advisor for urging him to take up such a task when most Negroes thus engaged have been failures. If we invest our money in some enterprise of our own, 
those in charge will misuse or misappropriate it. I have learned from my study of economics that we had just as well keep on throwing it away. Upon investigation, it was discovered that this complainant and most others like him have never invested anything in any of the Negro enterprises, although they have tried to make a living by exploiting them. But they feel a bit guilty on this account, and when they have some apparent ground for fault finding, they try to satisfy their conscience, which all but condemns them for their suicidal course of getting all they can out of the race while giving nothing back to it. Gossiping and scandal-mongering Negroes come to their assistance. Miseducated by the oppressors of the race, such Negroes expect the Negro businessman to fail anyway. They seize upon unfavorable reports, exaggerate the situation, and circulate falsehoods throughout the world to their undoing. You read such headlines as, Greatest Negro Business Fails, Negro Bank Robbed by Its Officers, and The Twilight of Negro Business. The miseducated Negroes then stand by saying, I told you so. Negroes cannot run business. My professors pointed that out to me years ago when I studied economics in college. I never intend to put any of my money in any Negro enterprise. Yet, Investigation shows that in proportion to the amount of capital invested, Negro enterprises manifest about as much strength as businesses of others similarly situated. Negro businessmen have made mistakes, and they are still making them. But the weak link in the chain is that they are not properly supported and do not always grow strong enough to pass through a crisis. The Negro businessman then has not failed so much as he has failed to get support of Negroes who should be mentally developed sufficiently to see the wisdom of supporting such enterprises. Now, the highly educated Negroes who have studied economics at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Chicago will say that the Negro cannot succeed in business because their professors who have never had a moment's experience in this fear have written accordingly. The whites have the control of the natural resources and so monopolize the production of raw materials as to eliminate the competition of the Negro. Apparently, this is true. All things being equal from the point of view of the oppressor, he sees that the Negro cannot meet the test. The impatient, highly educated Negroes, therefore, say that since under the present system of capitalism, the Negro has no chance to toil upward in the economic sphere. The only hope for bettering his condition in this respect is through socialism, the overthrow of the present economic regime, and the inauguration of popular control of resources and agencies which are now being operated for personal gain. This thought is gaining ground among Negroes in this country, and it is rapidly sweeping them into the ranks of what are commonly known as communists. There can be no objection to this radical change if it brings with it some unselfish genius to do the task better than it is now being done under the present regime of competition. Russia so far has failed to do well this particular thing under a proletarian dictatorship in an agricultural country. But whether this millennium comes or not, the capitalistic system is so strongly entrenched at present that the radicals must struggle many years to overthrow it. If the Negro has to wait until that time to try to improve his condition, he will be starved out so soon that he will not be here to tell the story. The Negro, like all other oppressed people, must learn to do the so-called impossible. The uneducated Negro businessman, however, is actually at work doing the very thing which the miseducated Negro has been taught to believe cannot be done. This much handicapped Negro businessman could do better if he had some assistance but our schools are turning out men who do as much to impede the progress of the Negro in business as they do to help him. The trouble is that they do not think for themselves. If the highly educated Negro would forget most of the untried theories taught him in school, if he could see through the propaganda which has been instilled into his mind under the pretext of education, if he would fall in love with his own people and begin to sacrifice for their uplift, if the highly educated Negro would do these things, he could solve some of the problems now confronting the race. During recent years, we have heard much of education in business administration departments in Negro colleges. But if they be judged by the products turned out by these departments, they are not worth a continental. The teachers in this field are not prepared to do the work, 
and the trustees of our institutions are spending their time with trifles instead of addressing themselves to the study of a situation which threatens the Negro with economic extermination. Recently, the author saw the need for a change of attitude when a young woman came almost directly to his office after her graduation from a business school to seek employment. After hearing her story, he finally told her that he would give her a trial at $15 a week. $15 a week, she cried. I cannot live on that, sir. I do not see why you cannot. You have lived for some time already, and you say that you have never had permanent employment, and you have none at all now. But a woman has to dress and to pay board, said she, and how can she do it on such a pittance? The amount offered was small, but it was a great deal more than she is worth at present. In fact, during the first six or nine months of her connection with some enterprise, it will be of more service to her than she will be to the firm. Coming out of school without experience, she will be a drag on a business until she learns to discharge some definite function in it. Instead of requiring the firm to pay her, she would pay it for training her. Negro Business Today finds the miseducated employees its heaviest burden. Thousands of graduates of white business schools spend years in establishments in undergoing apprenticeship without pay and rejoice to have the opportunity thus to learn how to do things. The schools in which Negroes are now being trained, however, do not give our young people this point of view. They may occasionally learn the elements of stenography and accounting, but they do not learn how to apply what they have studied. The training which they undergo gives a false conception of life when they believe that the business world owes them a position of leadership. They have the idea of business training that we used to have of teaching when it was thought that we would teach anything we had studied. Graduates of our business schools lack the courage to throw themselves upon their resources and work for a commission. The large majority of them want to be sure of receiving a certain amount at the end of the week or month. They do not seem to realize that the great strides in business have been made by paying men according to what they do. Persons with such false impressions of life are not good representatives of schools of business administration. Not long ago, a firm of Washington, D.C. appealed to the graduates of several of our colleges and offered them an inviting proposition on the commission basis, but only five of the hundreds appealed to responded and only two of the five gave satisfaction. Another would have succeeded, but he was not honest in handling money because he had learned to purloin the treasury of the athletic organization while in college. All of the others, however, were anxious to serve somewhere in an office for a small wage a week. Recently, one of the large insurance companies selected for special training line 15 college graduates of our accredited institutions and financed their special training in insurance. Only one of the number, however, rendered efficient service in this field. They all abandoned the effort after a few days trial and accepted work in hotels and with the Pullman Company, or they went into teaching or something else with a fixed stipend until they could enter upon the practice of professions. The thought of the immediate reward, short-sightedness, and the lack of vision and courage to struggle and win the fight made them failures to begin with. They are unwilling to throw aside their coats and collars and do the groundwork of Negro business and thus make opportunities for themselves instead of begging others for a chance. The educated Negro from the point of view of commerce and industry shows no mental power to understand the situation which he finds. He has apparently read this race out of that sphere. And with the exception of what the illiterate Negroes can do blindly, the field is left wide open for foreign exploitation. Foreigners see this opportunity as soon as they reach our shores and begin to manufacture and sell to Negroes, especially such things as caps, neckties, and house dresses, which may be produced at a small cost and under ordinary circumstances. The main problem with the Negro in this field is salesmanship. That is where he is weak. It is unfortunate that the educated Negro does not understand or is unwilling to start small enterprises which make the larger ones possible. If he cannot proceed according to the methods of the gigantic corporations about which he reads in books, he does not know how to take hold of things and organize the communities of the poor 
along lines of small businesses. Such training is necessary, for the large majority of Negroes conducting enterprises have not learned business methods and do not understand the possibilities of the field in which they operate. Most of them, in the beginning, had no experience, and started out with such knowledge as they could acquire by observing someone's business from the outside. One of them, for example, had waited on a white business club in passing the members of a box of cigars or bringing a pitcher of water. When they began to discuss business, he had to leave the room. About the only time he could see them in action was when they were at play, indulging in extravagances which the Negro learned to take up before he could afford them. Negro businesses thus handicapped have not developed stability and the capacity for growth. Practically all worthwhile Negro businesses which were flourishing in 1900 are not existing today. How did this happen? Well, Negro businessmen have too much to do. They have not time to read the business literature and study the market upon which they depend, and they may not be sufficiently trained to do these things. They are usually operating in the dark or by the hit-or-miss method. They cannot secure intelligent guidance because the schools are not turning out men properly trained to take up Negro business as it is to develop and make it what it ought to be rather than find fault with it. Too often, when the founder dies, the business dies with him or it goes to pieces soon after he passes away, for nobody has come into sufficiently close contact with him to learn the secret of his success in spite of his handicaps. The business among Negroes continues individualistic in spite of advice to the contrary. The founder does not take kindly to the cooperative plan, and such business education as we now give the youth does not make their suggestions to this effect convincing. If the founder happens to be unusually successful too, the business may outgrow his knowledge, and becoming too unwieldy in his hands, may go to pieces by errors of judgment. Or because of mismanagement, it may go into the hands of whites who are usually called in at the last hour to do what they call refinancing, but what really means the actual taking over of the business from the Negroes. The Negroes finally withdraw their patronage because they realize that it is no longer an enterprise of the race, and the chapter is closed. All of the failures of the Negro business, however, are not due to troubles from without. Often, the Negro businessman lacks common sense. The Negro in business, for example, too easily becomes a social lion. He sometimes plunges into the leadership in local matters. He becomes popular in restricted circles, and men of less magnetism grow jealous of his inroads. And men of less magnetism grow jealous of his inroads. He learns how richer men of other races waste money. He builds a finer home than anybody else in the community, and in his special program, and in his social program, he does not provide for much contact with the very people upon whom he must depend for patronage. He has the finest car, the most expensive dress, the best summer home, and so far outdistances his competitors in society that they often set to work in childlike fashion to bring him down to their level.